in our first two sessions uh, over the last few weeks uh, on the Tree of Life, we've looked at themes arising from the Tree of Life and the references to it in Genesis 3 and seen how those themes are reflected in the Genesis record, particularly when it deals with sacred trees in the text. And there are many similar examples in other books of the Old Testament. We looked at a few of those, just a couple of those last week in Exodus. But perhaps you noticed in your daily readings this week that in yesterday's readings, there was an obscure reference to a tree when uh, Saul was inaugurated as a king. And you might think that's an odd and perhaps an insignificant thing, but you will find that Paul's ministry as a king are bookended by references to trees, one at the very beginning and one, of course, at the very end when he dies. Uh, and there's significance in that. And indeed, in today's readings, you may have noticed in Isaiah references to the myrtle and the um, fir tree in uh, Isaiah 55, and uh, particularly in the context of the kingdom age. So it keeps coming out all the way through. But tonight, we're going to be concentrating on the tree of life in the New Testament. But before we come to the New Testament, I want to start in Ezekiel 47 because there's a passage in Ezekiel 47 which is taken up in our reading for tonight in Revelation 22. The final references to the tree of life in Scripture are very appropriately in Revelation. The tree of life is the first tree mentioned in the Bible and it is the last tree mentioned. The term appearing two or three times in the final chapter of Revelation, depending on which translation you use. Now, there's an anticipation of these references in Ezekiel 47, reading in verses 6 and 7, firstly, when the prophet saw very many trees on one side of the river or, and, or the other of a river. Ezekiel 47, 6 and 7. And he said unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen this? Then he brought me and caused me to return to the brink of the river. Now, when I returned, behold, at the bank of the river were very many trees on the one side and on the other. And verse 12, and by the river upon the bank thereof, on this side and on that side, shall grow all trees for meat, whose leaf shall not fade, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It shall bring forth new fruit according to his months, because their waters they issued out of the, the sanctuary. And the fruit thereof shall be for meat, and the leaf thereof for medicine. And we note here that Ezekiel says that specifically there shall be many trees on either side of the river. If we come to our reading for, that we've just had in Revelation 22, we'll find that this imagery is taken up in that chapter where the tree of life is linked to Eden restored and to the lifting of the curse that came as a direct consequence of the disobedience of Adam and Eve. So Revelation 22, verses 1 to 4. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. But there shall be no more curse, but the Lamb of God and of the but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. So as in Ezekiel 47, verse in verse 2, the tree of life is said to be on either side of the river. How can one tree be on both sides of a river? Well, obviously, it suggests that there is not just one tree, but rather a forest or an orchard. Perhaps we could call it a wood through which the river flows. And some translators, Brother Thomas in particular, uses the word wood in the sense of a forest, but as we'll see later, very significantly to choose that word to describe this collection of trees. There is not just one tree, but rather a forest or an orchard through which the river flows hence the many trees from Ezekiel. And you'll see in verse 3 an unmistakable reference to the lifting of the curse from Eden, while verse 4 speaks of the assumption of intimate and unfettered fellowship with God. And we record that in Eden up to chapter, in Genesis up to chapter 3, the fellowship with God had been unfettered through the angels, but it had been unfettered. 
now it's to be through the lamb as God's representative. So this wood of life or orchard of life is composed of many individual trees, the leaves of which are said to perform a therapeutic role in the healing of the nations. I think this suggests again that the wood is, of life is a symbol of the immortalised saints who in the kingdom age will impart both literal and spiritual healing to the mortal population. They have become one with their Lord as constituents of the tree of life at that time. And so they may be regarded as the leaves of that tree, just as they are the branches of Christ, of the Christ vine, which John refers to in John 15, verse 5. And if you saw that slide we have up prior to the class, uh, an extract of, from Sister Eusebia Lazzi, as you'll see, she picked up those thoughts in her book, Yahweh Elohim. So this image of the saints as trees aligns with uh, the words of Isaiah in, six, in Isaiah chapter 61. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to bring claim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And so this tree of life in Revelation 22 equates with the trees of righteousness of Isaiah, the planting of the Lord. And Revelation 22, verse 3, as we noted, refers to there being no more curse. So the cursing posed in Genesis 3 is to be removed. And it was imposed specifically because Adam had hearkened to the voice of Eve rather than the word of God as it had been revealed to him. Removal of the curse will mean more than just the end of the blighting effects of mortality. Something much more amazing and wonderful will be ushered in. Unconstrained fellowship with God. Adam and Eve had been denied access to the tree of life in the midst of the garden because they disobeyed God. In content, contrast to their failure, we read in Revelation 22 verse 14 of the blessing of those who are obedient. Revelation 22 verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Adam had not done the commandments of God. He specifically had breached them. And so he was expelled from the garden. So he could not access the tree of life. But here in verse 14, those who do his commandments have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates of the city. And we recall, we recall how cherubim had been appointed to guard or protect the way of the tree of life. And now in the age to come, the obedient will have access, the right of access to the tree of life and unimpeded access to what verse 14 calls the city and therefore sweet fellowship with God. And I think the term the city here refers to the new Jerusalem that's described in, Gen in Revelation 21. Now, the leaves of evergreen trees grow old and fade over time. And even the longest living trees eventually succumb to old age and some malady will afflict them to end their life. But the constituents of this forest of life will never fade because they are incapable of decay. At that time, Revelation 21 verse 4 says that God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. That's, um, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor cry, neither shall there be any more pain, which is another way of confirming the removal of the curse imposed in Genesis 3. Now, in addition to these references in chapter 22, the tree of life, of course, occurs early in the book of Revelation in chapter 2, where it's found in the conclusion to the letter to the Ecclesia in Ephesus, and specifically in the reward promised to those that hear in that letter, those who overcome. So back in Revelation 2 and verse 7, at the end of 
the letter to the Ephes to the Ecclesia in Ephesus when we read this. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the Ecclesians. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now, given the precedent in Eden, we may be certain that in this passage, the idea of overcoming involves overcoming the power of sin and death, overcoming that power that afflicts all the descendants of Adam. That is a reversal of the failure of Adam and Eve in Eden. Adam had been expelled from the garden lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Now the way to the tree of life, having been preserved by the cherubim, the faithful who endure to the end are printed to access the tree and eat and live forever. And this link to the Garden of Eden is underlined in verse 7 by the description of the tree as being in the midst of the paradise of God. And you'll recall that in Genesis 2 verse 9, it says that the tree of life was in the midst of the garden. So this is very much the promise of Eden restored. Now, each of the letters uh, to the seven ecclesias in Revelations 2 and 3 concludes with a promised reward for those who overcome. Where they've got them up there in that table on the screen. But just quickly go through them. In Ephesus, they're promised the reward is promised to be given to eat of the tree of life. In Smyrna, it is shall not be heard of the second death. For Pergamos, the reward is to give to eat of the hidden manna and will give him a white stone and the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth save he that receiveth it. To Thyatira, the promised reward is to give power over the nations. In Sardis, he is that he shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. In chapter 3, verse 12, for Philadelphia, it's make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out, go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. You notice their language, which... John comes back to in chapter 21. And then in verse 21 of chapter 3, to Laodicea, grant to them, he will grant those who sit to the faith, the ones who overcome, will be granted the right to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Now, each of these rewards was promised not just to the members of the individual ecclesia in whose letter they are recorded. Each case, you'll notice the text specifically says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the ecclesias. So all saints who overcome in whatever place or age will be so rewarded. I'd like you to keep your hand in chapter 2, because we'll be coming back there in a minute, but flick across back now to chapter 21 of Revelation. Because collectively, these rewards for those who overcome in chapter 21, are described as inheriting all things, including sonship of God. So we read in Revelation 21 and verse 7, Revelation 21 and verse 7, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. So back in Revelation 2 and 3, we can regard the various rewards promised in, in those letters in Revelation 2 and 3 as different facets or aspects of the promise of life eternal. And they are all and they are therefore all encompassed in that phrase, all things that the faithful will inherit. Think of it a bit like a precious gemstone that's been finely cut. So that as you turn it in different angles and the light hits it from different angles, each facet reveals a new piece of the glory and the beauty of the gem. Well, so these are, as it were, seven aspects or seven facets of that gemstone of life eternal. And each of them relates to that. And so giving to each of the tree of life connects us to the promise of the reward for the faithful in the kingdom age. This shows that even though there was unquestionably a literal tree of life in the Garden of Eden, that literal tree is no longer relevant. It no longer exists and is no longer relevant. 
What matters now is the way of the tree of life. And eating of the tree of life becomes a metaphor for immortality and the reversal of the curse imposed in Eden. So back in Revelation 2 and verse 7, Brother Thomas paraphrases the promise of Revelation 2 verse 7 in these terms. So we're there. To the believer that overcomes the world, will I, the Lord, who am the life, give glory, honour and immortality when I come to stand on the Mount of Olives and to re-establish the kingdom and throne of David as in the days of old. It's no accident that in verse 7, the word paradise rather than garden is used. Paradise is a word rich in connotations. Even our own language is a very rich and expressive word. Paradise, it's from the Greek paradisos, was in fact not really a Greek word, but one derived from a Persian source. And indeed, our English word paradise came to us transliterated from Persian via Greek and Latin and French. It's a very well-travelled word. And it's retained essentially that same form all the way through. The word denotes a park or orchard or pleasure, pleasure ground and carries the idea of an enclosure as does the Hebrew word gan, the word used for garden in Genesis 2, verse 8. And in the Septuagint, paradisos is the word used in that verse in, in relation to the Garden of Eden. Those in Ephesus and others like ourselves who heed the, words, the Lord's words to those ecclesia and elsewhere, all those who overcome are given the promise of Eden re-established. So paradise in the Bible, as we said, it's derived from that Persian source and has those very rich ideas. And those who heed God's word uh, will be promised Eden re-established. Paradise occurs only three times in the New Testament. The other occasions are Luke 23, verse 43. We'll look at that a bit later. And 2 Corinthians 12, verse 4, which appears to be a reference to the era beyond the millennium. The Persian word also came across into Hebrew in a transliter transliterated form as pardes. As in the original language, it also denotes the idea of a park or forest or orchard. And it occurs only three times in the Old Testament. In Nehemiah 2, about the king's forest. In Ecclesiastes 2, verse 5, it refer to orchards in the plural. And then in the Song of Solomon 4, verse 13, as orchard. Now, the garden of God is a rich theme in the prophets, especially in Isaiah. But we don't have time to pursue it today. Uh, but there's much that's worth thinking about there uh, as you do your daily readings. In the apocalyptic phrase, tree of life, in Revelation 2 and Revelation 22, the Greek word translated tree is zhulon, of which the primary meaning is wood or as in fuel for timber. So wood as you might have in your wood heat for burning in your fuel stove or your fuel uh, your wood heater. There is a Greek word dendron, which means a living tree, but that's not the word the Spirit chose to use when referring to the tree of life, although dendron is used in other places in the book of Revelation, in several other places. But God chose to inspire John to use the word julon, meaning wood, rather than the word that means strictly a living tree. In the Septuagint, Zulon is used for trees or gallows on which people were hung or upon which the corpses of people who had been executed were hung as a public demonstration. You'll see there a few examples of that. Genesis 40, and verse 19, which we looked at in one of our classes. Deuteronomy 22 and verse 21, a verse that's quoted in relation to our Lord as being cursed for hanging on a tree. Joshua 10, verse 26, and Esther 7, 9 and 10. Now, the first of those in Genesis may refer to gallows rather than the tree, but the middle two references imply a living tree. 
And the Esther passage relates, of course, as we said, to Haman. That the tree so described in the book of Revelation is living is surely implicit from the fact that one may eat of it in chapter 2, verse 7, and in chapter 22, verse 2, that it bears leaves and fruit. So clearly it's a living fruit, even though it's not the strict Greek word used for that. Why then is the word Julon used rather than dendron? Well, the use is not obviously an accident. There's a doctrinal reason for doing so. In the New Testament, Julon occurs 19 times. Three of those refer, it's in the authorised version, three of those refer to the tree of life and 11 relate to the arrest and crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ in various ways in some cases. When Judas led the high priest guards to arrest Jesus in Gethsemane, they were armed with staves, we read in Matthew and Mark and Luke. The ESV, the New International Version, the New King James Version all render the word as clubs. Young's literal translations renders it as sticks. But in each case, the word is julon, in other words, a lump of wood. And as Jesus was being led to his crucifixion, he described himself as a green tree, using the word julon in Luke 23, verse 31. Now, a green tree by, is, by definition, a living tree. And, of course, Jesus was the Lord of life. To those who believed in Jesus, he offered life. You recall in John 10, verse 10, he said, I am come that they might have life and that they may, might have it more abundantly. What Jesus Christ offered perishing men and women was more than just healing. He offered them deliverance and the law of death, the reversal of the curse imposed in Eden. As John wrote, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, in the New Testament, there is a word for the cross. Our Lord, our Lord was crucified, a word that's derived actually from the Latin word crux for the cross on which he was executed. And in the New Testament, the Greek word translated cross is stavros, and it occurs 28 times. Most of the uses refer to the cross on which our Lord was put to death. Example, for example, in John 19, several times. On one occasion, it's used generically of the crosses on which the Lord and the thieves crucified with him were executed. Again, in John 19, verse 31. And in a few places, as you, as you recall, it's used figuratively when the Lord speaks of the need for each disciple to identify with him through self-denial and to take up his cross. Uh, for example, in Mark 8, verse 34, but he says it more than once. Given that there's a standard Greek word for cross, and it's one which is used frequently in the Bible, it must surely be significant that another word sometimes is used to refer to the cross. And we do find that Julon, translated as tree, is used in several instances to describe the cross on which our Lord was crucified. Three times in the New Testament, the text says that Jesus was hanged on a tree while twice the cross is referred to as a tree. So of this total of five references, three are in Acts. Hanged on a tree in Acts. Firstly, Acts 5, verse 30. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew, and hanged on a tree. Acts 10, verse 39. We are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. And then in chapter 13 of Acts in verse 29, when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulchre. In each case, they could have said, could have referred to the cross, but they chose to emphasise that he was put to death on a tree, hanged on a tree. And there were further such examples in the epistles. In Galatians 5, 3 verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. And then in 1 Peter 2, verse 24, 
speaking of our Lord, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. In all five of these places, the word julon is used to refer to the tree on which our Lord was crucified. So what do we have? We have the green tree being nailed to a dead piece of lumber, thereby transforming that cross into a tree of life. Through the sinless life of Christ, and specifically to use the language of Philippians 2 verse 8, through his obedience even unto the death of the cross, the faith will have life and have it more abundantly. As Brother J.B. Norris wrote in his book, Christ Died for Our Sins According to the Scriptures, the cross of Christ became in its outworking the tree of life. And that obscure etching that you see on the, scroll, on the slide is an 18th century British etching where some very clever man has managed to combine the idea of the cross and the tree of life in one image with our Lord being crucified on the tree of life. We can see how those thoughts come together. We could see the cross then as bringing together both the trees that were in the middle of the Garden of Eden. The fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, a fruit which is always desirable to the mind of the flesh, was never more riper than when Jews and Gentiles conspired against the Son of God and crucified him. The men who conspired against our Lord were men who knew good and evil, but they chose evil over good. They and the systems they represented went on to mould into dust, but the holy, harmless, and undefiled Son of God triumphed over death. He rose to life eternal and thus opened the way of the tree of life for others who believe in him. I'd like you to come over now, please, to Luke 23 and verse 41, 40 and 41. Luke 23, you will recall of course, that there were two others, thieves, who were crucified along with our Lord. They too were nailed to a cross or a tree. And one of those men continued to rail against Jesus in Luke 23, verse 39. But his companion was more contrite, and he rebuked him. Luke 23, verse 40 to 41. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear God? seeing thou art in the same condemnation. And we indeed justly, for we received the due reward for our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And so then in a penitent state, one of the thieves turned to Jesus, expressed faith in him as Israel's Messiah, and sought redemption. In verse 42, he asked, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Our Lord's response hearkened back, to the Garden of Eden and pointed forward to the glorious reward promised in Revelation 2, verse 7. Or verse 43, Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And here again is our Greek word paradisos, one of the three uses of that word in the New Testament. In his book, The Genius of Discipleship, Dennis Gillett firstly paraphrases our Lord's response to the penitent thief, and then goes on to define what the Lord intended by the word paradise. You are asking me to remember you in the day when I come again, but I give you my assurance today. When that time comes, you will be with me in paradise, in my kingdom. Jesus used the word paradise because it represented all the things that were the very opposite of their then present plight. The garden of God, the place of peace, joy, tranquility, life developing and life abundant. Christ was promising joy instead of pain, happiness instead of sorrow, life instead of death. So like Paul, this man was crucified with Christ. You recall Paul says that in Galatians 2, verse 20. This man, like Paul, was crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, he shall live through access to the tree of life in the midst of the paradise of God. Come over now, please, to John chapter 19. 
The night before his arrest, our Lord went to the Garden of Gethsemane, where he struggled in a battle of wills. An angel was sent to strengthen him, and he overcame, determined to do God's will rather than his own. Now, Adam also had access to the angels bef uh, before he fell, but he failed when tested in the garden. In contrast, our Lord triumphed in the garden. And after Jesus had been crucified, his lifeless body was taken down in place in the tomb, which had never seen death. John is very clear to make sure we know that, because it was a tomb that was never associated with death. And that tomb was in another garden, verse 41 and 42 of John 19. Or we'll read from verse 40. Then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new sepulchre wherein was never man yet laid. There laid they Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day. For the sepulchre was nigh at hand. So our Lord is laid to rest in a garden. How significant it is, he should be laid to rest in a garden. At creation, Adam had been placed in a garden, in Genesis 2, verse 8. And now the last Adam also was placed in a garden. When Jesus was resurrected and granted immortality, he took place in a garden. The tree of life is the first tree mentioned in the Bible and is the last tree mentioned in the Bible. And similarly, the Garden of Eden is the first garden mentioned in the Bible. And this garden is the last one mentioned and described as a garden in the Bible. It also is significant that the resurrected Jesus was mistaken for a gardener, as we read in verse 15 of John 20, because Adam had been the gardener in Eden. Come over now, please, to Acts 16, where we have an interesting use of the word eulon. In Philippi, you'll recall that Paul and Silas suffered persecution for the sake of the gospel. We read of this in verse 22 and to 24 of, Luke, of Acts 16. Acts 16 from verse 22. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stops. In every other instance in Acts where Zulon is used, it refers to the cross upon which Jesus Christ was crucified. And we've already looked at those in Acts 5, 10 and 13. And as we've seen, Paul used the word himself to refer to the tree upon which our, his Lord was crucified in Galatians 3. Now, he is, Paul is the apostle who would say to the Galatians, I am crucified with Christ. So as such, Paul may have seen in his experience in Philippi in earnest of what it is to fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake. If Paul and Silas did see in this in the stocks this instrument of torture and confinement a link to the suffering of their Lord, it would have strengthened their resolve to endure. They would have seen in these stocks a link to the tree of life and the great deliverance that's promised to all the faithful who in the days of their probation are held in bondage to the law of sin and death. In conclusion, I'd like you to come to John 14. We ref have referred to this verse in passing in previous classes, and I'm sure your thoughts have often gone there as we've gone through these studies. The promise of Revelation 2 verse 7 is that those who overcome will be permitted to eat of the tree of life. Well, think of what that involves eating of the tree of life. It's a promise which, in which a, a tree is associated with life. There's a concept of eating and there's the implicit promise of the removal of the curse imposed in Eden. And these features come together in our Lord Jesus Christ in John 14 
where he describes himself as the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, we'll pick it up from verse 1. Let your heart, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. And where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. You recall that the way was a, was a term by which the early believers were referred to when they, as we speak sometimes of the truth, so they sometimes spoke of the way in Acts. Our Lord is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus stated that except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. In John 6. And Peter noted that Jesus bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness. Those who are crucified with Christ, as we've seen in Galatians 2, make, their cross, make that cross their tree of life. Those who endure faithful to the end will experience Eden restored, including unfettered fellowship with Almighty God and access to the tree of life renewed for eternity. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. So that brings us to a conclusion of our studies. I hope you've found that this theme interesting. I hope you've it's helped you not just appreciate the idea of the tree of life in throughout the scripture, but also this fact that God uh, re reveals the gospel to us in various ways through the Word of God, including through the repetition of ideas to help our, our minds link things together and develop a richer understanding of what is promised in God's word. So I hope that's been interesting. I hope you've kept, you've been able to follow the, the thinking. Uh, if, it was, if the ideas were new to you, uh, if you are interested in pursuing it further, there is in fact a book uh, that uh, I put this all down in. And a lot more, as you can gather, because it's 330 pages long, uh, which was published a couple of years ago. Uh, you know, if you are interested, I'd get the book. I don't think you should hang out waiting for the DVD to be made. Uh, it's not going to happen very soon. But um, if you are interested, perhaps you'd like to follow that up or talk with me, talk with me further when you're next when I'm next at Barossa. So thank you very much for your engagement with this subject and I hope that's been useful.